Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. What you're looking at here is the largest rocket attack that I've observed since the beginning of the war. And I, I've pretty much been tracking this since the war started. Uh, this just happened today. Uh, at the time of this recording, it was, it, it's been less than an hour since this happened. I was preparing this video as this happened. And uh, the topic of this video is the 1,290 days. Uh, I know that this is a very popular thing right now. I know that because about a million people have commented in my videos or sent me emails about it. And uh, I think that it's intriguing. Uh, the idea is, if you don't know, um, in the last chapter of Daniel, Daniel asks, like, how long are these things going to take place? referring to, you know, tribulations. And he's just given an answer that it's, uh, you know, going to be 1,290 days, and blessed is he that makes it to the 1,335 days. And so somebody, now I, I'm, I'm feeling that this came from a central point, like one person. I don't know who it is to this day, if it was some YouTube channel or, you know, a Facebook group, but somehow this, like, this idea spread like wildfire that since the time that the church closed the temples until the beginning of the war on October 7th, it was 1,290 days. So here's the uh, First Presidency uh, letter. First Presidency temporarily closes all temples. The First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints issued the following letter, March 25th, <clears throat> 2020. So that's like the well, either, not so much that, but the day after that is the begin date. Um, so, uh, to Latter-day Saints everywhere. Dear brothers and sisters, after careful and prayerful consideration and with a desire to be responsible global citizens, we have decided to suspend all temple activity churchwide at the end of the day on March 25th, 2020. So, the first day that they would have been closed would have been March 26th. From that time... Uh, until whenever they reopened. Okay, so uh, on timeanddate.com, you have this really neat calculator where you can uh, count the days in between two dates, or, you know, the website does that for you. You just plug in the dates. And so <clears throat> I put the start date as March 26, 2020, and the end date, uh, October 7th of this year. And it just so happens that it's 1,290 days. So you can see how that's exciting. And a lot of people got excited. And I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, as you know, I don't tend to view these numbers in a literal sense <clears throat> based on what we've studied on um, the church website. But <clears throat> we don't know. Um, we don't know for sure. Uh, there is a symbolic meaning to three and a half because this represents three and a half years. You can see it right here. Three years, six months, 11 days, or 42 months, 11 days, uh, excluding the end date. Okay, so three and a half. We've talked about three and a half. We're going to talk about it in this video. We're going to consider everything having to do uh, with this, and could this potentially be prophecy fulfilled? Now, <clears throat> a lot of people have been declaring authoritatively that Daniel's prophecy has been fulfilled. I would caution you, caution you not to go that far. Neither you nor I are in a position of authority to declare prophecy fulfilled. We should say it could be. It could be. I guess we'll see. Let's just wait, and then the Lord will make it known if it is, in fact, declared, if this is what he meant, uh, talking to Daniel in the uh, last chapter of the book of Daniel. So the other date that goes along with this <clears throat> excuse me, is blessed is he, uh, we're going to read the actual scripture, blessed is he that uh, waiteth or comes to the 1,335 days. And so if you do the same thing, okay, um, if you have, you start with March 26 of 2020, the 1,335 days is tomorrow. <clears throat> and that's why I wanted to do this video today just in case something happens tomorrow. And it's really interesting that, you know, we have this that just took place today. I don't know that this is going to necessarily escalate things, 
it may or may not. I mean, it's it's another rocket attack, but it is very large. Like I said, the way that I've been tracking it, I don't count every single one of these locations. That would take up too much time. You see how there's all these locations? I'm not going to count all those. An easier way for me to do that, to compare rocket attacks to other rocket attacks, is going to this part of Seva Adom. Uh, that's the name of this website. And counting the number of lines right here. You see one, two, three, four, five, and just counting that way. It's not precise, but it's I think it's accurate enough. And uh, this is the largest rocket attack that I have seen since monitoring this. And I, and I don't think that I missed any of the big ones. So um, this one, the largest one that I had seen to this point was a 32 line attack. And this one was 44. So it kind of really went above and beyond uh, the largest one to this to this point. Um, before we get into the scriptures and the stuff that we're going to study, uh, I want to give a, a brief little um, tidbit about this rocket attack. It, like I said, I was preparing this video um, as this happened. And I actually <clears throat> stopped to eat breakfast. Uh, my wife made me a really good breakfast. And um, I was enjoying it. And I was watching I-24 News English. And uh, they were talking about the rocket attack as it was happening. Uh, and it, I'm, I'm really ha I'm happy that this lady that was being interviewed was there. Because let's see if I can get a picture of her. It's this girl right here. So she's being interviewed. And she's like, you know what? I, I was actually expecting this. I was just talking to the, pr the producer actually about the significance of today. Uh, and she went on to tell kind of like a little history story about how this is the anniversary of this guy's death right here. Okay. It's uh, today. You can see right here. Let me zoom in. <clears throat> see the 20th of November, 1935. Today is the 88th, the 88th anniversary of when he died. And you'll notice right here, his last name is Al-Qasam. And some of you may recognize that name because that's what um, these like brigades are called uh, that are part of, I want to say, I'm pretty sure, part of Hamas, the Al-Qasam brigades. Let me, let me just, hang on. Al-Qasam brigades, I got to make sure. Let's go to this Wikipedia thing. Who are they part of? Um, off and short to al Qassam Brigades, military wing of the Palestinian organization Hamas. Oh, okay. Yeah, see. <clears throat> That's what Hamas calls its brigades, the al Qassam Brigades. So the al, -Qas the al Qassam name comes from him. And who is he? Okay, so his name is Iz al-Din Abd al-Qadar Abin Mustafa Abin Yusuf Abin Muhammad al-Qasam. Say that five times fast. Was a Syrian Muslim preacher and a leader in the Arab nationalist struggles against British and French mandatory rule in the Levant and a militant opponent of Zionism in the 1920s and 1930s. Okay, so you can see why he's popular. Al-Qassam studied at Al-Azhar University in Egypt and afterward became an Islamic revivalist preacher in his hometown of Jab Jabla in Syria during the last years of Ottoman rule. Following his return, he became an active supporter of the Libyan resistance to the Italian occupation, raising funds and fighters to aid the Libyans and penning an anthem for them. So he, he was like you know, a leader against these European forces and against uh, Zionism. He would later lead his own group of rebels in alliance with Ibrahim Hananu to fight against French mandatory forces in northern Syria in 1919 to 1920. Following the rebels' defeat, he immigrated to Palestine, where he became a Muslim waqf, religious endowments, official that though that's the, the those are the ones that administered the temple mount and grew incensed at the plight of of palestinian arab peasants in the 1930s he formed bands of local fighters including the black hand and launched attacks against british and jewish targets 
He was eventually killed in a manhunt by the British authorities in 1935 following his alleged role in the killing of a policeman. Israeli historian Tom Segev has called him the Arab Joseph Trumpledore. His campaign and death were factors that led to the 1936 and 1939 Arab Revolt in Palestine. So he was a big uh, name. Okay. <clears throat> I guess maybe one of the founding fathers, probably no one would say this, but one of the founding fathers of today's like resistance against uh, Israeli forces and, um, you know, Western influence in the Middle East, I guess you could say. But uh, today, today precisely is the 88th anniversary since he died. And according to that commentator, she thinks that's why there was this large attack and probably to expect more large attacks like this later today. So I guess we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see if there's any attacks. We'll, it'll come up live while we're doing the video and uh, I'll share that with you. So could this be something that escalates things further? I don't know. I wouldn't think so, but it could be. Uh, there was a large attack by Hezbollah in Lebanon uh, that actually destroyed like a barracks on a military base. And that was kind of a big escalation. I, there's this from War Monitor. Uh, supposedly, Hezbollah has published this video titled, We Are Coming. Which, I mean, I, I guess we'll see. That's what you've been saying since the beginning of the war. And that's what Iran has been saying. Like, everyone's been saying that we are coming. Um, but that hasn't really come to fruition, has it? So, anyway, there's this uh, Hezbollah video. But this is what I was talking about. This is from Mario Nafal. Justin, intense Hezbollah attack targets northern Israel. Israel media sources report that today's attack on the north is the most intense since the start of the ongoing conflict. So you see that? The most intense in the north from Hezbollah. And then, as far as I know, from my own observations, the most intense from Hamas, as far as like rocket attacks go. Hezbollah is said to have launched 25 missiles and shells, including a suicide plane from Lebanon towards Kiryat Shimona and Margliot, uh, causing damage in the area. The attack is described as a combined assault involving anti-tank missiles, mortar shells, and rocket launchers. Now, I had seen that this was actually um, a barracks. So I'm not going to get into that more. If there, if the, I may cover it more in another video. But anyway, so two big escalations today. Okay, so let's read this scripture in uh, Daniel. Let's, let's read the whole chapter because it's very short. It's only uh, 13 verses. Okay, starting with the chapter heading. In the last days, Michael, which we know is Adam, will deliver Israel from their troubles. Daniel tells of the two resurrections. The wise will know the times and meanings of his visions. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and were, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So, I, I, it seems that the consensus is that this is referring to the final war. Okay. Um, we, we've looked at Gog and Magog, the, the Battle of Armageddon, and uh, it seems like whenever we're talking about things like this, time of trouble such as was never never was uh, since... Okay, what a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Whenever we're talking about that kind of thing, it seems to be um, referring to the final war. All right, continuing. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn away to turn okay, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, knowledge shall be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two other, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, and this is like a, continu a continuation of a, of a vision. It, it's, um, 
what we've studied is it seems that it's the Lord uh, that's essentially st- standing above this river uh, in this vision, talking to Daniel. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in, clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the, whole, the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now, remember, um, time, times, and a half, most biblical scholars agree that that means three and a half. Okay? So the question is, how long is this going to be? And then um, the Lord says, it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he and when he shall accomplish to scatter the peop, the power of thy the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard but understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Okay, so this is that key verse. Daniel 12, verse 11. From the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. So people are taking that to mean or applying it to when the temples were closed, because this seems to be temple language, at least temple temple language from that day, from Old Testament times, when you would go to the temple and offer animal sacrifices. So it mentions from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and it also says, in the abomination that maketh desolate set up. So... Usually when we're talking about the abomination of desolation, it's referring to uh, Israel or specifically Jerusalem being under attack, under siege, destroyed. Okay. Now you could say that in the spiritual sense that the church is being attacked. And uh, Sister Nelson has said as much. She, She said after the October 2022 General Conference that they knew that that conference was a singular event. Uh, solely based on the number of attacks uh, on the church leading up to that. So I think we all know that the church is under attack. Does that equate to the abomination of desolation? I don't know. Could it be a parallel between our church being under attack and under siege by hostile forces and then Israel uh, literally being under siege or being attacked? I don't know. There could be a parallel. There could be like a dualism there. I don't know. But anyway, continuing, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. So that's that's going to be tomorrow, if this is correct. If this idea that it started with the closure of the temples, uh, then tomorrow would be the 1,335th day. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in, the, in thy lot at the end of the days. All right. So, um, by the way, I have one of the few playlists that I saved. I basically deleted all of them. I'm starting over using a new format, but there are a couple that I saved. And one one of them is this playlist called Book of Daniel Chapter by Chapter, where we went through the entire book and then we read what was said in the Institute Student Manual. So, uh, I think this is worth a watch. So, I would encourage you to check this out if you haven't already. Okay, but <clears throat> let's move on. I um, I did a search in the Scripture Citation Index to see if anybody had spoken about Daniel chapter 12. And relatively speaking, relative to other chapters and other books, no, not really. Um, there have been a few, you know. Um, for example, there was one... Sorry, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but I guess I will. 
So for example, uh, Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, this is uh, Dallin H. Oaks at the time, Elder Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve, April 2001. The significance of our increased discretionary time has been magnified many times by modern data retrieval technology. For good and for evil, devices like the internet and the compact disc uh, have put at our fingertips an incredible inventory of information, insights, and images. Along with fast food, we have fast communications and fast facts. The effect of these resources on some of us seems to fulfill the prophet, the prophet Daniel's prophecy that in the last days, knowledge shall be increased and many shall run to and fro. So you have, you know, you have quotes or you have um, general authorities that cite Daniel and then talk about things like this. But nothing really concrete talking about these time frames. It's just, it's not here. It hasn't been cited. It hasn't really been talk, talked about at all. Um, so we're going to go ahead and go to the Institute Student Manual. And uh, first, I want to read this entry right here for Daniel chapter 11. So this is the previous chapter where it talks about all these different like wars and stuff. Because this kind of leads into chapter 12. I want to read this first and then read what it says for chapter 12. Daniel's vision of successive kings, wars, and conflicts. It is clear from the sketchy way in which the prophecy deals with the events of the time period covered in this chapter that Daniel's intention was not, Daniel's intention was not to emphasize the history, but only to give it as a background in order to indicate its effects upon the Lord's people. As Keel and Delish wrote, quote, the prophecy does not furnish a prediction of the historical wars of the Seleucidae in the Ptolemies, but an ideal description of the war of the kings of the north in the south in its general outlines. Okay, general outlines. Whereby it is true, diverse special elements of the prophetical announcement have historically been fulfilled but the historical reality does not correspond with the contents of the prophecy in anything like an exhaustive manner, end quote. So he's saying, basically, he didn't give like a specific point for point chronological description of these final wars in chapter 11. That generally, um, a lot of it's happened, but it's, it's not meant to be like, you're supposed to read it and then figure out exactly how it was supposed to happen it's just giving, like it says, the background. Uh, it says the background in order to indicate its effects upon the Lord's people. All right, continuing. The lack of direct correspondence between the chapter and history seems to indicate that Daniel did not intend to present a detailed chronology of future events, but rather to give an overview of some of the main events that would influence the Lord's people. The following statement suggests that some of the events prophesied in this chapter may have been given as indicators of the nature of the conflict between the kingdoms of the world and the kingdom of God. That is, they were types of future events. Quote, By the war of these two kingdoms, for the sovereignty, not merely were the covenant land and the covenant people brought in general into a sorrowful condition, but they they were they also were the special object of a war which typically characterizes and portrays the relation of the world kingdom to the kingdom of god this war arose under the uh seleucidian antiochus epiphanes uh to such a height that it formed a prelude of the war of the time of the end the undertaking of this king was to root out the worship of the living god and destroy the jewish religion shows in type the great war which the world power in the last phases of its development shall undertake against the kingdom of God. Several things Daniel mentions seem to be dualistic, having application to more than one period of time. The, the abomination that maketh desolate in Daniel 11.31 is one example of this dualism. Though this verse could quite properly be interpreted to refer to the destruction of Jerusalem and desecration of the temple by Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, which has been the conclusion of many scholars, the abomination of desolation was also mentioned by the Lord in reference to the destruction of Jerusalem in the temple by the Romans in AD 70. 
It has, it, it has also been applied to destructions which are still in the future. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote about the abomination of desolation by Daniel. These conditions of desolation, born of abomination and wickedness, were to occur twice in fulfillment of, Dan, of Daniel's words. The first was to be when the Roman legions under Titus in 70 AD laid siege to Jerusalem, destroying and scattering the people, leaving not one stone upon another in the desecrated temple and spreading such terror and devastation as had seldom, if ever, been equaled on the earth. Then, speaking of the last days, our Lord said, And again shall the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet be fulfilled. That is, Jerusalem again will be under siege. It will be during this siege that Christ will come, the wicked will be destroyed, and the millennial era commenced. So, based on this definition, um, that's one thing that I have to question a little bit about uh, Daniel twelve eleven, because it says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, which people are interpreting to mean the temple's being closed, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, which this is talking about the abomination of desolation. If you click on this, it brings up, you know, a topical, topical guide, abomination of desolation. Well, this would be referring to uh, Jerusalem being under attack and in siege. And that didn't start in 2020. Unless it ha unless you, it's to be interpreted that in like some kind of way they formed the plans at that time, which could be. That'd be really interesting if Hamas's uh, plans for this attack uh, started back in 2020. And in that way, the abomination that makes the desolate was set up. But we don't know. So this is something that we have to take into consideration. All right, let's go back here. Um, I'm actually going to move on. Let's move on from that. And let's now talk about what it says about chapter 12, uh, verses 7 through 13. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? The interpretation of the time periods mentioned in these verses has not been revealed by the Lord as yet. And this is important because, again, um, there's a lot of people saying this has been fulfilled. Well, I'm waiting until somebody says that it's been fulfilled. It, it very well could be, but I think that we would do well to listen to the prophet and the Lord himself. And maybe at some future date, they'll point back and be like, look, that's what Daniel was talking about. It was talking about the time from when the temples were closed until the start of the war. And then fine. But I don't think that we can definitively say that it's been fulfilled. We don't have the authority to do so. Numerous calculations of formulas have been put forward, each in their turn to be proven wrong. William Miller, a founder of the Adventist, move Adventist movement, predicted Christ's coming in 1844, which prediction Joseph Smith declared to be false. Let's look at that really quick. So this is William Miller. Okay. It says here, William Miller was an American Baptist minister who was credited with the beginning, with beginning the mid 19th century North American religious movement known as Millerism. After his proclamation of the second coming, did not occur as expected in the 1840s, new heirs of his message emerged, including including the Advent Christians, the Seventh-day Adventists, and other Adventist movements. And he put together this timeline right here. We've looked at this before, and it's similar to all the stuff that's still produced today. Uh, people endlessly trying to calculate things to figure out when the second coming is going to happen. And so this is what got everybody excited um, about the, the 1840s. And this is what Joseph Smith said about this, because he, he knew about this. This is in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 341. But I will take the responsibility upon myself to prophesy in the name of the Lord that Christ will not come this year, as Father, Father Miller has prophesied. For we have seen the bow meaning the rainbow. And I also prophesy in the name of the Lord that Christ will not come in 40 years. And if God ever spoke, and if God ever spoke by my mouth, he will not come in that length of time. Brethren, when you go home, write it down that it may be remembered. 
Jesus Christ never revealed to any man the precise time that he would come. Go and read the scriptures and you cannot find anything that specifies the exact hour he would come. In all that say so are false teachers. Um, so this is interesting because Father Miller was not um, saying that he was not giving like an exact hour, it doesn't seem, or even an exact week or month. He was just saying, I guess, um, 1844. But it seems that Joseph Smith was opposed to his, you know, putting this kind of thing together to try and figure out when he was going to come. So that's another reason why I always use caution whenever these kind of calculations come up and why I think that these numbers are not meant to be for calculation purposes. Um, Let's go back here. Miller's calculations came from an interpretation of this passage in Daniel. Time and time and again, people have thought they had the key to, and enticed others to believe, only to reap disappointment. Even today, there are those who predict earthquakes and great calamities occurring on specific dates based on this passage in Daniel, and sadly, they still entice others to believe and follow. The prophet Joseph Smith said that if the Lord did not give the key for interpreting a symbol or image he employed, he would not hold his children responsible for it. See notes and commentary on Ezekiel 1 verses 15 through 21. And I have that pulled up. What is represented by the wheels that Ezekiel described? Because Joseph Smith received from the Lord some keys for interpreting the meaning of the beast in John's vision, the parallels between John's vision and Ezekiel's give some clues to the meaning of the beasts Ezekiel saw. There is, however, no parallel in John's vision to the wheels seen by Ezekiel. So you know what this is talking about. He's saying, okay, there's in the book of Revelation, there's some beasts that seem to parallel beasts in Ezekiel. But in the book of Revelation, it doesn't talk about uh, wheels and there was no interpretation given uh, about wheels or anything like that. So we don't know. All right, continuing. The prophet Joseph Smith said, Quote, I make this broad declaration that whenever God gives a vision of an image or beast or figure of any kind, he always holds himself responsible to give a revelation or interpretation of the meaning thereof. Otherwise, we are not responsible or accountable for our belief in it. Don't be afraid of being damned for not knowing the meaning of a vision or figure if God has not given a revelation or interpretation of the subject. End quote. At present, the interpretation of Ezekiel's vision has not been given to the church, so the Lord does not hold his saints accountable for understanding what is represented by the wheels. And likewise, you could say the same thing about these numbers in, um, excuse me, these numbers in the book of Daniel. Continuing, for reasons not at present known, the Lord has not revealed the key for interpreting this passage, and until he does, Until he does so, speculation and calculation are pointless. So I I would generally agree that that that's true. You know, it's, it's kind of pointless. I, I not, I wouldn't say that it's pointless. I would say that, um, we just shouldn't spend too much time on it. Now I feel like it's too coincidental, you know, when it comes to the t- from the time that the temples were closed until the war started, it's too coincidental that it would be exactly 1,290 days. So I'm kind of like in the middle where I'm leaning more toward, no, the numbers are still, they're symbolic. They're not meant for calculation, but we don't know. The interpretation hasn't been given. It, it could be, it, it could be. So <clears throat> let's just make note of it, but let's not, um, start uh cashing out our retirements or (laughs) or doing crazy things let's just take note of it simply and just wait and see what happens and so now here we are a day before the 1335 days and if something happens tomorrow then great because that means that that may mean that this really is the prophecy that daniel saw and hopefully we're just you know so much closer to the second coming than than maybe we imagine Okay, we need to cover this again. This is uh, the Institute Manual for Revelation, 
uh, chapters 4 through 11. And uh, the section that we're going to read is for chapter 11, verses 2 through 3, and 9 through 11, 42 months. Okay, it says here, um, The angel told John that Jerusalem would be trodden underfoot 40 and 2 months. 42 months is the equivalent of three and a half years. Likewise, the two witnesses mentioned in verse 3 would prophesy and testify of Christ, Jesus Christ for 1,260 days, or approximately three and a half years. They would be slain, and their bodies would lie in the street for three and a half days. In the scriptures, particularly in Revelation, the number three and a half often describes a limited period of tribulation during which evil forces are allowed to do their work. So look at this, the, the symbolic interpretation of this. Since three and a half is half of seven, which symbolizes perfection and completion, it may represent imperfection and apostasy. It may also suggest that God will not allow evil to go on unchecked. Evil's time is bounded and limits are set. So we have to take this into account as well, you know, because one thousand right here it's talking about the 1,260 days um, that the two witnesses would prophesy. <clears throat> In Daniel, it's 1,290 days, which would still be about three and a half. So it may be symbolic. It really could be. It could just be saying, look, Daniel, I'm not going to give you like an exact time. Just know that I have limits on how long Satan can work and the forces of evil do their work. They're going to have their time, and their time is three and a half symbolically, but it's limited, and afterwards we're going to complete everything, and uh, good will triumph over evil, and Christ will come at the second coming. It, it may just simply be that. You know, it could just simply be that. Who knows? Who knows? Let me see how we're doing on time. Okay. The last thing that I wanted to go over is what uh, Bruce R. McConkie said in uh, Millennial Messiah about this chapter. So what we're looking at here is uh, his chapter called Armageddon, Gog, and Magog. And this is what he says. Having these things in mind, it is instructive to ponder what Daniel has to say about these final great conflicts that usher in the day of millennial peace. After speaking of the abomination that maketh desolate, Daniel says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. Those who oppose the covenant, that is, those who oppose the covenant, that is the everlasting gospel, shall be flattered into joining the godless forces. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. God is known by revelation. Knowledge of him is found in the hearts of the faithful. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. The gospel will be, will be taught. The mind and will of the Lord will be proclaimed. Those who oppose the cause of truth and righteousness will do so with their eyes open. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. These events shall go forward over a long period of time. There will be ample opportunity for all nations to choose the course they will pursue. The testing purposes of mortality will be fulfilled. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Though they fall in this life, they shall rise in eternal glory in the next. Even the saints must be tried and tested to the full. The Lord is determining whether they will abide in his covenant, even unto death. And those who do not so abide are not worthy of him. At this point, Daniel describes the anti-gospel, anti-Christ, anti-God nature of the king and his armies from the north. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, the scripture saith, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that, for that that is determined shall be done. Already, the communistic nations exhibit this spirit. 
As the polarization between good and evil continues apace in the last days, we may expect to see even more resistance manifest by them toward God and his laws. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, the account continues, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall the honor shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with the strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. He shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for a gain. From the perspective of Daniel, in whose day all men worshipped one kind of a god or another, what would be more strange than to worship a god composed of spirit, nothingness, or as the atheists do, to worship a philosophy that says there is no god? Clearly, the great issues at Armageddon are God and religion and a way of worship. Satan will have done his work well. By then, billions of Earth's inhabitants even more so than then than now will be in open rebellion against the gospel and every principle of truth and virtue found therein now daniel turns to the war itself and at the time of the end he says shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over it is a worldwide conflict He shall enter also into the glorious land. Armageddon and Jerusalem are the eternal site or the central sites and many countries shall be overthrown. Some nations shall escape and he shall have power over the treasure of gold and of silver and over all the precious things as many others. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to, to make away, sorry, utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his play, of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. That's from Daniel eleven fifteen through 45. As far as Daniel's account is concerned, the conclusion of the whole matter is summed up in these words. And at that time, the time of the end, Shall Michael stand up, the great, the great prince that standeth for the children of thy people? He shall sit at Adam on thy Amen, as we shall hereafter see. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. The full impact of Armageddon, of the abomination of desolation, of the final great war of the ages, the full impact shall fall shall fall upon the ungodly men. Sorry, the full impact shall fall upon the ungodly among men, and only those whose names are written in the book of life will find a full measure of security and joy. Then shall be brought to pass the resurrection that attends the return of our blessed Lord, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that are wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. After learning all these things, Daniel asked an angelic ministrant who ministered unto him this question, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? In reply, he was told, The words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And thus it is. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. So it seems that, you know, the context of Daniel 12, it's essentially talking about that time when uh, Jerusalem is being attacked. It's the final war, Gog and Magog. Uh, could this tie in to the temples being closed uh, in in 2020? I, I don't know. It could be, but I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. So we'll see, you know, if anything happens tomorrow. Again, already there's some things that are going on today which are noteworthy. This rocket attack, uh, a, p- a potential 
you know, big espl- ex- a potential big um, escalation by Hezbollah in the north. But we will just have to wait and see. But that's all that I have for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later.